Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Ultimate Persona Compendium. Persona 2 Innocent Sin was released June 24th, 1999, less than three years after the original game, and once again on the original PlayStation. Unlike the previous game though, it never made its way overseas. Instead, the game that would be known as Persona 2 in the West would be its sequel, Persona 2 Eternal Punishment, the second half of the Persona 2 duology, if you will. The two Persona 2 titles can be considered two halves of one story, but we're not going to be viewing them as such for the purposes of this analysis. Remember that rule I mentioned back in part 1 about not using information we didn't have access to at the time of each game's release? That will still be in effect here. This analysis will only be focusing on the story presented in Innocent Sin. We're not going to be calling forward to Eternal Punishment to shed light on this game. At least not yet. We'll save the analysis of how these two stories complement each other for the Eternal Punishment video. For now, we only have the one game. One that wouldn't see an official English release until its PSP remaster in 2011. The reasons for this were touched on by Atlas marketing manager Gail Salamanca. He said that it simply came down to a lack of manpower and resources since Eternal Punishment was already in development at the time. He did add that the US localization team was highly against this, though. Fortunately, it was eventually given an English patch in 2008 by Tom, who followers of this series may remember as the man behind the translated Persona mobile phone videos. His translation is what you'll be seeing whenever I show footage from the PS1 version, However, since this isn't an official translation, I'll mainly be referencing the English PSP version. Don't take that as a knock against Tom's efforts, though. Overall, it's an excellent translation. Impressive, considering it was done by one person. Innocent Sin expands on many of the same ideas as the first game. I'll be referring back to them at points, but I won't be delving too deeply into them here. My analysis of the first game already covered the core ideas that the series was built on, specifically the first video in that analysis, which also covered the history of the series. It won't be essential to watch that video to follow what I'm talking about here, but it'll definitely help. Innocent Sin isn't just a retread of the first game's ideas though. It brings a lot of its own to the table, and the purpose of this part will be exploring what those are. Just like in the Persona 1 analysis, we'll start by going over the story from beginning to end. An extended summary of the game's plot. The second part will explain the brand new battle system, the differences between the two versions of the game, and so on. Consider this part the ultimate story analysis for Innocent Sin, we will be looking at more or less everything over the next hour or so. So make yourself comfortable, grab a drink. Our journey through the Ultimate Persona Compendium begins again. Let us delve into Persona 2 Innocent Sin. Innocent Sin opens by introducing this game's silent protagonist a student at Seven Sisters High School. He can be named by the player, but canonically he is known as Tatsuya Suo, which is what he'll henceforth be referred to as. Tatsuya is greeted by a familiar face, Miss Seiko from the first game, who asks him what he plans to do after graduation. We then meet Lisa Silverman, a friend of Tatsuya's, in quotes. She's more his stalker with a pretty obvious crush. She delivers a message to him from Ekichi Michelle Mishina, a gang leader from Kasugeyama High, a rival school. It tells Tatsuya that he's kidnapped a girl from his school and demands that the two meet if he wants to get her back. 
This entire thing turns out to be a farce, however. With Akichi's band members simply wanting to recruit Tatsuya as a new member. The plot takes a turn for the serious, though, when the three of them summon their personas and meet a character you should all be quite familiar with by now. Philemon. He explains to them that the city of Sumaru has been distorted into a world where rumours are becoming reality, and that only they as Persona users can prevent this. The cast are a little sceptical of Philemon's claim, however, so they decide to test it themselves using the rumour of Joker a mysterious figure who supposedly grants wishes. It turns out to be true, but with a sinister twist. Those who are unable to name their aspirations have them stolen, turning them into hollow shells without hopes or dreams. Ikichi's friends suffer this fate, but not the three Persona users. Instead, Joker decides to kill them in revenge for a past sin, a sin none of them remember. Realising this, Joker spares them for the time being. The party are left to survive in the now demon-infested Sumaru, with the goal of unravelling the mystery of Joker, the rumours manifesting into reality, and their own pasts. Later, other Persona users join their party. Maya Amano, a magazine reporter, and her photographer assistant, Yukino Mayazumi, the very same Persona user who helped defeat the Snow Queen in the previous game. Along the way, they discover a cult called the Mass Circle, which is collecting dream energy from everyone in Sumaru using the five crystal skulls. Its objective is to use these skulls to power the spaceship Shibalba and fulfill the Oracle of Maya a doomsday prophecy that supposedly came from Mayan aliens. The mass circle is led by Joker, but there are various other characters that have been manipulated into doing its bidding. They act as the party's foils throughout much of the plot. The first of these is Principal Hanya, who makes a deal with Joker to make his students love and respect him, and also give him hair. The next is Yasuo Onoe, a power-hungry student who becomes Joker's slave in exchange for being made Student Council President. He's the game's first real antagonist, spreading rumours with the sole purpose of stopping the party. He lures them into the old bomb shelter under Kasugiyama High, a place that is said to be impossible to escape from. Fortunately, a loophole in the rumour allows them to find the exit and confront Yasuo, only to find that he's simply a weak pawn of Joker. He's promptly immolated by King Leo, a madman in the mass circle who uses much more extreme methods of delaying the party. He plants bombs in several buildings across Sumaru and leaves clues for them to follow. The last of these is at the Aerospace Museum, which the party has to evacuate with the help of Tamaki and Tadashi. Yes, this love duo returns from the first game as well. Maya and Tatsuya save King Leo's bumbling assistant, Ixquick, and Maya very nearly falls into the flames. She's caught by Tatsuya, who is reminded of a very similar event from the past, where he saved a girl from a mad arsonist at a shrine. He summoned his persona for the first time that day and burned the man's eye out, this arsonist turns out to be the true identity of King Leo, Tatsuya Sudo, who has an eerily similar name to the protagonist. After he's defeated, the party escapes the building via blimp and safely washes up ashore. We then hear a rumour that the five terrorists planting bombs around the city are actually them. For this reason, they decide to split up and meet back at the detective agency later. Here we're told of the last battalion, the remaining Nazi forces that helped Hitler escape Germany in secret and has been in hiding ever since. They've been waiting for the right moment to return and claim the Fuhrer's revenge. The party make their way to Alia Shrine, a place that had been set on fire ten years ago. 
It's rumoured that a girl was killed in that fire, and that her ghost still haunts the location to this day. They're once again visited by Philemon, who tells them that the truth of their past can be found in the pools underneath the shrine. They recall a happy childhood, when they all met at the shrine for the first time and became friends. They created a secret club between the four of them, and called it the Mass Circle. Later on, they'd meet an older girl who they affectionately called Big Sis, and together they continued to play as the Mass Circle. Shortly after though, she revealed that she won't be around for much longer. Her family plans to move away before the end of the summer. The children are devastated by this, so much so that they decide to lock her up in the shrine overnight so she can't leave. It was that very night when the shrine was burned down by the arsonist Tatsuya Sudo. They had all believed that she'd died in the blaze, something that terrified them so much they vowed never to speak to each other ever again. But Lisa would later learn the truth, the truth that no one had died in the fire at all, and that the girl had lived to hold a grudge. That girl was Maya Amano. She becomes twisted and cynical and vows to make them pay for their sins. Except, this isn't the real Maya. This is a shadow of Maya created by rumours and is just another part of Joker's plan. However, Joker's revenge is motivated by the death of Maya, something that never actually happened. His actual identity is that of Jun Kurosu, their friend from the shrine ten years ago. He himself has been swallowed by rumours. He's been manipulated by false memories where it was they who set fire to the shrine. The last battalion makes its move on Sumaru and advances on the Caracol, the Mayan ruins where the new mass circle is. When the party arrives, the two factions are fighting over control of Shibalba. They face off against Joker for the final time and are able to bring Jun back to his senses. He joins the party, replacing Yukino, and together they must collect four crystal skulls and reach the center of Shibalba. The only adversaries they face now are the Last Battalion and the remnants of the Mass Circle, led by Jun's father, the original writer of the Oracle of Maya, and the one who is determined to bring it to fruition. Or so, that's what it appears to be. I'd like to stop the story summary here for now, before we get into the ending because that's a lot to digest. The plot of Innocent Sin doesn't exactly lend itself well to a concise summary. There's a lot of details being thrown at the player, and it can become quite overwhelming. I assure you though, this is very deliberate. To explain why, we must first delve deeper, and explore its foundations in our own world. Firstly, let's reintroduce a name you should all be familiar with by now. Carl Gustav Jung. His ideas form the basis of the first Persona game, and they're expanded on further in Innocent Sin. Specifically, his idea behind the Persona, the image of ourselves we show to the world. He also coined the term Archetype, which is particularly relevant here. An archetype is a recurring pattern or characteristic that is projected universally by people. You watching this video have most certainly been associated with an archetype at some time or another. In fact, this may have been based off the seemingly unimportant details of your birth. Astrological signs. The idea that we're predisposed to certain personality traits based on the positions of celestial bodies in the sky. As the sun moves along the ecliptic, it passes through 12 constellations, each of which has an associated sign of the same name, and a ruling planet. In order, they are 
Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces. I, Snickety Slice, was born in late July, which would make me a Leo. This is something I've known since my Neo Geo pocket colour told me when I was a kid. Leos are said to have a good sense of humour, are passionate and creative, but on the downside are stubborn, lazy, and have a big ego. I'll leave you to decide how accurate this is. It's... it's quite accurate. But the point I'm trying to make is that these are archetypal roles. Archetypal roles that were allegedly influenced by the Zodiac. It should come as no surprise then that Jung himself was interested in astrology. He saw the correlation between the archetypes associated with each Zodiac sign, and his own idea of the collective unconscious. The mystical database from which all archetypes originate. Both are built on the premise that people are not born as blank slates, that they're influenced by something greater. Jung felt that there was some credence to the symbolism found within the Zodiac. The constellations themselves are not actually real, and neither are the signs that are associated with them. They're all creations of the human mind in the same way as mythology and the tarot. Nevertheless, they can all be interpreted as expressions of Jung's collective unconscious, and by extension, his archetypes. Astrology is one of the main motifs running through Innocent Sin, as cited in this interview with the three most important names in its development. Its art director, Kazuma Kaneko, its director, Kozi Okada, and its writer, Tadashi Satomi, a name I neglected to mention during the Persona 1 analysis, but is just as vital to the game's development as the other two. The symbolism of zodiac signs is used quite a lot in the narrative, and we'll be going into greater detail on the subject in the character analysis section. But for now, let's explore another part of astrology. The Grand Cross A Grand Cross is the alignment of at least four ruling planets at 90 degree angles of each other. Each planet has one of the opposing astrological elements. Fire, Earth, Air and Water. This is a significant astrological event. It signals a time of stress and great difficulty for those born under these signs. However, it has a different meaning depending on the type of signs involved. Whether they be cardinal signs, those that usher in a new season. Fixed signs, those that fall in the middle of the season. Or mutable signs, those which bring an end to the season. In extremely rare occurrences, a Grand Cross can also be accompanied by a solar eclipse. One such Grand Cross happened on August 17th in 1999. This on its own isn't that unusual though. What gave the Grand Cross of 1999 a grander significance is a prophecy by Nostradamus. The year 1999. Seventh month. From heaven will come a great king of terror, to bring back to life the great king of the Mongols. This disturbing culmination of events is what the dev team cited as one of the main influences of Innocent Sin. The Grand Cross is one of the final events to happen during Innocent Sin, meaning the game takes place in August of 1999. The Grand Cross isn't the only superstition from the real world that made its way into the game. In fact, all of the rumours found within the story have a basis in reality. The starship Shibalba is named after the Underworld from Mayan mythology. Its name roughly translates to a place of fear. Wait a minute. Did you say place of fear? 
Yeah, the Mayan underworld doesn't exactly sound like a fun place, does it? And didn't Nostradamus say from heaven will come a great king of terror? That could also be translated as king of fear! Oh my god... I'm scared! Anyway, Shibaba is accessed in the game through the Amano River, which the characters have to traverse by boat. Amano River is Amano Gawa in Japanese, which also translates to Milky Way. There's a visible rift in the Milky Way galaxy that is often described as a great river. The Kichamaya people also saw this rift as another gateway to Shibalba. The Crystal Skulls, which are used as a power source for Shibalba, are supposedly an ancient Mayan artifact. However, this one is more of a modern superstition, as no actual proof of their authenticity has ever been found. This didn't stop people from speculating though, and it's even said that Heinrich Himmler, an SS chief in Hitler's inner circle, had one in his possession at one point. Himmler had also founded the Anonurmba, an organisation with the mission of finding ancient artefacts that would prove the superiority of the Aryan race. Basically, it was all propaganda and historical revisionism. There are also accounts that they had discovered something called the Spear of Destiny, the spear that had been used by the Roman soldier Longinus to pierce Jesus Christ on the cross. Hitler became infatuated with the spear and believed it would allow him to rule the world. It was said to have been imbued with supernatural powers, and had been possessed by many conquerors and kings. This myth was popularised by the book The Spear of Destiny by Trevor Ravenscroft, a source that is incredibly dubious at best. However, Hitler did indeed possess a spear that matches its description. It's even still on display at the Imperial Treasury in Vienna to this day. The rest is most likely a fabrication by the book though. You could say that it was this book that started the whole Holy Lance Nazi connection, but the Nazis' obsession with historical artefacts lends it believability. It's another believable myth that is still repeated by people to this day, and this is why it was included in Innocent Sin. The Spear of Destiny appears in Hitler's possession in the game with all of its magical powers, granted by the rumours surrounding it. The amount of references here is a testament to Satomi's attention to detail, but the average player doesn't really need to know most of this. They serve to illustrate how people can be led on by insane conspiracy theories if they sound believable enough. Earlier, I mentioned that you come away from the plot feeling a little overwhelmed by all the details, and this is what I meant. Just like in real life, you come across all kinds of rumours and misinformation, and you may not have time to scrutinise it all. Sometimes you just have to ignore it and soldier on, as our party members do in the narrative. But other times, you may end up believing them you may end up being manipulated by misinformation, which is what happens to various characters in the game. But misleading information doesn't just come from nowhere, it has to be spread by a person who misinterprets the information they come across, or it's been spread maliciously by someone with an agenda. In this way, the entirety of Innocent Sin can be read as a criticism of the media in general, this is one of the reasons why Hitler and the Third Reich are a part of the plot. They had employed propaganda on a large scale to spread their ideology, which, of course, had a nefarious anti-Semitic purpose. There's a quote by Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's main propagandist, which is relevant here. If you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes the truth. This quote is particularly ironic though, because Goebbels never actually said it. People just think he did because it's been repeated many times. 
I thought I'd share it anyway though, because that is literally how it works in the game. A more relevant figure on this subject would be, once again, Carl Jung, who referred to this kind of groupthink brought about by propaganda as mass-mindedness. In this broad belt of unconsciousness, which is immune to conscious criticism and control, we stand at defenseless, open to all kinds of influences and psychic infections. As with all dangers, we can guard against the risk of psychic infection only when we know what is attacking us, and how, where and when the attack will come. His solution to this innate vulnerability is to remain vigilant. Scrutinise oneself. Because nobody ever has as much self-knowledge as they think they do. This is the only means of breaking through the deception and remaining true to one's morality. And this is exactly what Jun Kurosu is able to do towards the game's final act. But not everybody is able to do this. Innocent Sin paints a grim world where rumours are dominant. Where falsehoods are to be accepted as truths. In the first Persona game, Philemon represented the enlightenment we can all achieve. The truth of oneself and the world in which we inhabit. Persona 2 is the other side of the coin. Blissful ignorance and the destruction it brings. It belongs to Philemon's shadow. A character we will discuss soon enough. For now, let's look at the events that put the plot into motion. The initial spreading of rumours, and the Persona users that have to deal with the aftermath. Persona. Chronologically, the plot of Innocent Sin starts with this man. Tatsuya Sudo. When he was a student at Seven Sisters, he began hearing voices in his head. His history teacher, Akinari Kashihara, interpreted these voices as prophetic messages from aliens, and together they set about compiling them into a tome, called the In La Kitch, which derives its name from the Mayan greeting, In La Kitch a la Keen. This can be interpreted as, I am you, and you are me. Which is suspiciously similar to the mantra spoken by summoned personas. I am thou, thou art I. Within the In La Kitch is a poem that predicts the end of the world. The Oracle of Maya. The book's contents were entirely bogus, but the power of rumours brought them into existence. Each of the lines in the Oracle of Maya comes true, making the poem a spoiler in plain sight. The Seven Pleiades set the frozen time free. The Seven Pleiades from Greek mythology are also known as the Seven Sisters, which is the origin of the school's name. Seven Sisters High has a clock tower that long ago stopped working. Akinari Kashihara had fallen into its gears and died. He believed that if the clock tower ever started functioning again, setting the frozen time free, it would signal the end of the world. Wild dance, shadowed festival, foreign song ensue. A reference to the Muses concert that Lisa performs at. Lisa is Caucasian, so an English solo was written especially for her, making it a foreign song. As flames of expiation light the heavens, the four pillars of fire caused by Tatsuya Sudo's bombs. The lion's roar echoes far and wide. The Leonid's meteor showers, which derives its name from the Leo constellation. They can be seen at the summit of Mount Katisumori when the last battalion march on the Caracol. The head monk points out that they shouldn't be falling at this time of year, meaning they're a contrivance made possible by rumours. Five skulls glow in the depths of the earth. 
The Holy Cross shines high up in the sky. A skull is placed in four temples, with the remaining one being placed where they all intersect, which is the center of the caracol. This marks the beginning of the Grand Cross. Once the star comes to a complete halt, the Earth stops rotating, bringing about the end of the world. The Maya Maiden's heart stops with it. What then remains is a paradise on Earth. These events come to pass during the ending of the game, which I have avoided talking about until now. Innocent Sin's ending is quite shocking, and deserves a little build up before we jump right into it. At the very centre of Shibalba, within the collective unconscious, is the character that set all of these events into motion. Nyalafotep, the crawling chaos that Philemon warned of, who up until now has been masquerading as Akanari Kashihara and Adolf Hitler. He was responsible for the voices that Tatsuya Sudo heard. He manipulated Jun into becoming the Joker using false memories, and he's the reason why rumours are now becoming real. So who is Nyarlathotep? This was something I briefly touched on in the Persona 1 analysis, but now it has a bit more importance. He is the symbol of evil in the human heart. He is the very worst aspects of humanity personified. He's Philemon's shadow, in a sense. Both characters are godlike entities that watch over human affairs and originate from the collective unconscious. However, while Philemon believes in the potential of humanity to overcome their darkness, Nyarlathotep believes that they are doomed to succumb to it and destroy themselves. But why was a creature from the writings of H.P. Lovecraft chosen to represent this? Well, like most of Satomi's writing, it's more than a simple reference. His first appearance was in the short story Nyarlathotep, written in 1920. It begins with a foreboding sense of dread, a prelude to the arrival of a great evil. A terrifying man from Egypt travels from place to place, amusing the public with shows of supernatural powers, before driving them mad with nightmarish visions. Essentially, Nyarlathotep is a harbinger of doom. His appearance can be felt in the air, and marks the beginning of the end for human civilization. A similar tone is felt in Innocent Sin's plot. Nyarlathotep isn't the only appearance of the character though. He would appear in a variety of other stories, but in different ways. He would never appear under the same guise, similar to how he takes the form of multiple people in Innocent Sin. This makes Nyarlathotep unusual compared to other cosmic gods in the Cthulhu mythos. Rather than a huge monster beneath the sea, Nyarlathotep walks the earth like a regular person, and is fully aware of humanity. He even speaks human languages. Much of Lovecraft's work has the philosophy of cosmicism, the idea that humans are insignificant and at the mercy of an indifferent cosmos. Nyarlathotep may not care about humanity, but at the very least he acknowledges their existence. To the rest of the Cthulhu deities, humanity is no more important than a speck of dust in the infinite cosmos. This idea is the version of him we see in Persona. He may have disdain for humanity. He may think they're weak, pathetic, and devoid of purpose. But at least he sees them. He has a similar origin to his counterpart Philemon who came to Jung in a dream. Nyarlathotep was based on a vivid nightmare Lovecraft experienced. 
You could say they both came into contact with archetypes from the collective unconscious. Archetypes that are destined to be in opposition of each other. At the end of the game, it's revealed that the two had made a wager on whether humanity would overcome their trials. Whether they would resist the darkness in the human heart and defeat Nyarlathotep, just as the characters in the previous game had. And they do. But this isn't just a test for the five Persona users. All of humanity are a part of their game, and one of them does exactly what Nyarlathotep wants. With that, the Maya Maiden's heart stops with it. Originally, it was Maya Okamura who was to be the Maya Maiden that would be sacrificed to fulfill the Oracle. She's given another choice though when she realizes that Maya Amano fits the same criteria. She uses the Spear of Destiny to pierce Amano's heart, bringing the Oracle to a close and sealing the world's fate. Even in defeat, Nyarlathotep wins. But Philemon offers them a way to change things. Use the power of the collective unconscious to create a new timeline where this tragedy never occurs. However, it comes at a great price to the characters. Changing the timeline would also mean that they never meet all those years ago at the shrine their memories and friendship would be erased. They reluctantly accept. And at this point, the player has a choice of either thanking Philemon, or punching him. Choosing the latter reveals that, beneath the mask, Philemon has the same face as Tatsia. This is because Philemon is Tatsia. Not in a literal sense, but a symbolic one. The person Tatsia is mad at isn't Philemon. It's humanity itself. Philemon is simply a reflection of the human soul. He's another facet of the collective unconscious we're all connected to. This is the meaning of the words, I am thou, thou art I. If only more people could have remained strong and not been taken in by the darkness in their hearts, taken in by Nyarlathotep, chaos and ruin could have been avoided. As fate would have it, they all meet up again in the new timeline without any memory of each other. And as the final verse of the Oracle of Maya goes, Marking the end and a new beginning. The revelation of the wager between Philemon and Nyarlathotep brings a grander context to the story. Not just the story of Innocent Sin, but the first game as well. In the series, Philemon is an observer and cannot directly intervene in human affairs. He can give them the tools they need to overcome their hardships on their own such as the power to use Personas and the Velvet Room, but he's not able to fight on their behalf. Nyarlathotep, on the other hand, is actively trying to destroy humanity, and isn't bound by the same limitations. He doesn't use brute force to go about this though, at least not until he's cornered. While Philemon gives humanity the tools they need to self-actualize, Nyarlathotep gives them the tools they need to destroy themselves. He uses delusions, trickery, and manipulation. Because humans are actually stronger than he gives them credit for. In the first Persona game, I speculate that it was he who led Maki to the Davis system, putting that entire plot into motion. This event is never explained in the game itself. His appearance in that game was brief, but it wasn't out of character. 
He manipulates Kandori and gives him power beyond that of a regular Persona user. He lost that wager though, because humanity overcame their trial. In Innocent Sin, his plan is similar. He bends reality to one controlled by rumours. This is neither good nor evil. There's nothing inherently evil about rumours. It's people that decide that. In fact, the characters even use rumours to their advantage at many points. There's even an entire game mechanic dedicated to it. And yet, it ends up working in Nyarlathotep's favour. Because he believes paranoia and misinformation will ultimately win. And he was right. Nyarlathotep may be a malevolent entity, but he at least believes in a fair game. Which is probably why he made a wager with Philemon to begin with. Nyarlathotep's cynical view of humanity takes on a common theme in Innocent Sin. People's ideals and aspirations for the future. He seems to detest humanity's weakness for collectivism. Those who rely on others to realise their dreams. This is why his ultimate plan to destroy humanity involves them putting all their faith in an imaginary utopia. He also does this to Jun on a much smaller scale. He replaces his father and gives him a sense of importance by making him the Joker. The figure that grants others dreams and takes it from those who are uncertain of their dreams. The former are selfish, immediate desires masquerading as dreams. The carnal desires of the Shadow, such as Yasuo's power trip. While the latter is possibility, dreams not yet realised. These kinds of dreams only materialise during Jung's individuation process. It's a more difficult road, but it ultimately leads to a more fulfilling life. Nyarlathotep obviously doesn't respect this notion, which is why he chooses to grant power to the weak and unenlightened. Jun himself is just another victim of this. As a child, he used the mass circle to escape from his rough home life, and he came to see Maya as an ideal surrogate mother. As for his father, he tried to pretend that he was a great man, when in actuality he was thought of as a deadbeat nutcase. This desire for an ideal father one he could look up to like Maya, is what Nyarlathotep took advantage of. Jun is punished more than any other character by Nyarlathotep, and it's this reliance on other people that is at the heart of it. He wants to be deluded by a dream of ideal parents, so he allows Nyarlathotep to create him one. He joins the mass circle along with Tatsuya Sudo, Genji Sazaki, Anna Yoshizaka, Akari Hoshi, and even his own mother, Junko Kurosu. All of them have given up and decided to take the easy route, where they don't have to think or chase after a dream they may not achieve. They're symbolic of what the party could become if they let themselves be consumed by nihilism. They have relinquished their individuality to become cogs in the collective machine. Succumbing to Jung's mass-mindedness I mentioned earlier. The mass crushes out the insight and reflection that are still possible with the individual. And this necessarily leads to doctrinaire and authoritarian tyranny. This is warning of a society where the individual is swallowed by the collective. This is a state where the individual is most at risk of being manipulated by a charismatic force. When people don't have a deep enough understanding of their own psyche, they appeal to a higher authority. Cult leaders and dictators. 
Nyarlathotep uses this inherent weakness in people to his advantage, but he doesn't believe it to be a good thing. In fact, he takes great delight in mocking Jun for his foolishness. He becomes the leader they desire, just so he can turn around and throw it back in their faces. His goal truly is utter demoralization of humanity. Up until now, we've been analysing the plot of Innocent Sin and its main antagonist, but we've only briefly touched on the other characters. Specifically, the six main playable party members. Like last time, I'll be analysing each character, along with their personas and arcanas. This game gave a greater importance to zodiac signs, so we're going to be looking into those as well. A young Yun concept that returns from the first game is Shadows. The Shadow is the repressed and denied parts of us that are hidden away in the unconscious mind. If gone unacknowledged by the conscious mind long enough, the Shadow will begin to fester, and be projected outwards onto society and other people. It's a denial of the universal truths of the Ego, that we are not perfect beings, that we harbour within us the potential for great evil. The Shadow guards the path to the unexplored parts of the self. If we're ever to get there, it must first be defeated. It must be assimilated into our conscious mind, the Ego, and it must be recognised as another facet of ourselves. I understand now. I admit it. That you have a place in my heart. In Innocent Sin, this concept is presented a little differently to how it was in the first game. As we've discussed, Nyarlathotep is not an individual's shadow, but the collective shadow of all of humanity. Similar to Maki in the first game though, there are shadows that are tied to individual characters. With the exception of Jun, each party member has a shadow doppelganger brought into existence by rumours. They're present as boss battles in the Zodiac Temples which form the Grand Cross. The temples are themed after the characters with the respective Zodiac signs. The exception to this rule is Myers, who accompanies the party to Mount Iwato, and Yukinos, who is fought inside the Caracol. Since Maya is the first shadow we encounter, she'll also be the first character we take a closer look at. Maya is the oldest member of the cast, and the one everyone looks up to as a big sister. The sole exception to this is Yukino, who sees her more as a friend and colleague. Her arcana is the moon which can represent illusion, deception, and anguish. Some sources have even interpreted this as a metaphor for the conscious and unconscious mind. One side of the moon is visible to all, which is the face we show society, and the other side is dark and uncharted. A literal shadow, if you will. On the surface, Maya is optimistic and the most cheerful of the group. This is best conveyed by her favourite catchphrase, Think Positive. Or, as it's known in the Japanese version, Let's Positive Thinking. He said it! Let's Positive Thinking! However, this is often a front she puts on for the benefit of others. She's weaker than she lets on. And there are instances where it's up to Tatsuya to console her, 
and let her know that she doesn't have to act strong. The source of her weakness is rooted in her childhood. She never got over her father's death, and carries around a good luck charm to remind her of him. A stuffed rabbit called Mr. Bun Bun. This is also a subtle nod to the moon rabbit of Asian folklore. She's terrified of fire because of her near-death experience at the shrine. And this is another hint that she's unable to escape her past. Unlike the other characters, she never accepts her shadow as a part of herself, making her possibly the most flawed member of the cast. You couldn't be more wrong. Bye, Ms. Imposter. Just like the moon from where she takes her arcana, one side will forever be in perpetual darkness. These personality traits are also present in her zodiac sign, Cancer, which has the moon as its ruling planet. The moon motif goes even further when we examine her ultimate persona, Artemis. She's the Greek goddess of hunting and the moon, and is the daughter of Zeus and Leto. She was a chaste maiden, and this can also be seen in Maya's personality. She says she's too tied up in work to have time for men. Her initial persona is Maya, one of the seven Pleiades who were the companions of Artemis, and the daughters of the Titan Atlas, which is the origin of this lovely developer's name, by the way. She was the oldest of the seven sisters, making her the big sister, which is also Maya's role in the original Mass Circle. Next we have Yukino Mayazumi. She's the odd one out amongst the game's party members, being the only one that wasn't in the mass circle. Her arcanas and personas remain the same from the first game, so I won't be going too deeply into those. I will, however, be talking about her growth in this entry. In the last game, Yukino was a reformed delinquent thanks to her teacher, Miss Seiko. In Innocent Sin, three years later, we see a continuation of that story with Yukino becoming a more responsible adult. She's now an apprentice magazine photographer. She sees her younger self in another character, Anna Yoshizaka and attempts to guide her in the same way Miss Seiko did for her. It's a logical extension of her Empress Arcana, and ultimate persona, Durga. She was once the big sister figure to the Persona 1 cast, and now she's the same to Anna. Her photography mentor, Shunsuke Fuji, is fatally wounded outside the Caracol. He urges her with his final breath to follow her dreams, become a great photographer, using the camera he left for her. However, her dream is thrown into question when she comes face to face with her shadow. Shadow Yukino represents the doubts of her direction in life. She originally wanted to become a teacher like Miss Seiko, but felt she wasn't smart enough. Now she fears she isn't talented enough to be a photographer either, and that maybe, just maybe, it would be easier if she returned to her old ways. She reassures herself though that her dream is within reach if she keeps soldiering on, as she's done many times before. This is the lesson that she passes on to Anna. Following this realisation, Yukino decides to give her persona to Jun, as she feels she doesn't need it anymore, bringing her character arc to a close. Next we have Lisa Silverman, a Caucasian girl raised in Sumaru by American parents. Her father is a Japanophile, also known in some academic circles as a weeaboo 
and because of this, he tries to raise Lisa to be a traditional and proper Japanese lady. She rejects this idea, though, and rebels against her father's wishes. She speaks Cantonese and practices Kung Fu. She wants to be different, but she also wants to fit in. It's revealed that Lisa had been the victim of bullying throughout her childhood because of her race. This is why she's very distrustful of other people. She becomes very cynical towards her friends Miho and Mami when they ask her to join their idol group. She laments that she can't speak English or be as interesting as others want her to be. Her shadow implies that these are the underlying reasons for her pursuing Tatsuya, as well as using drugs and going on dates with older men. Lisa's desires are contradictory. She rebels against society's expectations of women, but also just wants to be accepted by other people. This is the internal struggle with her shadow. This temptation is a part of her arcana, the Lovers, a card that is represented by the story of Adam and Eve. It's an allegory for love and relationships in general, a journey from the initial passion felt from love to the more serious questions it poses. This theme also runs through both of her personas, Eros, the Greek god of love, and Venus, the Roman goddess of love, beauty, and virtue. Venus is also the ruling planet of Taurus, Lisa's zodiac sign. The Taurus sign is associated with love and passion, but also possessiveness and jealousy, which can be seen in her unrequited love for Tatsuya. She declares herself his boyfriend at various points, even though it's not true. It's often presented comical in nature, until her shadow puts it in a more sinister light, demanding that Tatsuya belongs to her and no one else. Following her shadow's defeat, she accepts this part of herself and changes for the better. She chooses to respect Tatsuya's decision, However, no matter who he chooses, Lisa's dream of marrying Tatsuya doesn't change. If anything, she becomes more determined, with the revelation that she's had that crush since they were kids. This idea of unrequited love is an aspect of the reversed lover's arcana. When an arcana is reversed, when it's been turned upside down, it essentially takes on the opposite meaning. Reversed Lovers becomes about disharmony and the lack of commitment. In any case, Lisa is a character that is driven and defined by love. <laughs> Next we have Akichi Mishina, a delinquent vocalist for his band Gas Chamber, who also goes by the stage name Michelle. On the surface, he is narcissistic and flamboyant, but like the rest of the cast, this is simply a persona he puts on, and there's much more going on under the surface. His arcana is death, a transformation from one stage of life to another. Akichi's transformation relates to his childhood, where he was made fun of for being overweight, he sets out to become a stronger and more confident person, and he succeeds, but in his heart, he's still that shy, compassionate child from 10 years ago. Even with the rebellious front though, he's unable to stand up to his strict father, Kankichi Mishina, who expects him to eventually take over the family sushi business after graduation. He never even returns home in his usual visual K fashion sense, and this is our first hint at his lack of confidence. 
He wants fame and admiration to compensate for how weak he really is. This weakness also shows when he uses his persona to beat up other people. He uses it to get back at those who bullied him, only to realise that he himself has become the bully. He wants to believe he's using it to protect the weak, but it's also so he can feel powerful. It's a self-serving motive that he doesn't want to admit is there, but it is. These traits are a part of his zodiac sign, Scorpio. Scorpios are said to have a shadow that desires control. However, they're also deeply empathetic, and are at their best when making meaningful connections with friends. This also extends to lovers, as we see in his storyline with Miyabi Hanakoji. As a child, he was friends with Miyabi, a pretty and popular girl who also ended up making fun of him due to peer pressure. This left her with an intense sense of guilt, which would lead her to gain weight, a reverse of what happened to Akichi. Akichi and Miyabi still have feelings for each other, but neither of them knows this. Miyabi is terrified of what Akichi will think of her now that she's overweight, and Akichi is afraid of her reaction to his new personality. Akichi's shadow represents his low self-esteem hidden beneath the visual K aesthetic. His character arc is discarding his false bravado and embracing who he used to be. Someone who would love Miyabi regardless of what she looked like. His initial persona is Radamanthus, one of the three judges of the dead in Greek mythology. His ultimate persona shares the same theme. Hades, the god of the underworld with which his name is synonymous with. Just like his arcana, this theme of death is metaphorical. It represents the many deaths and rebirths in his personality. His Scorpio sign also shares this theme, as it's ruled by the planet Pluto. The Roman god Pluto is what Hades would be later known as. Next we have the player character, Tatsuya Suo. You might think that since he's a surrogate for the player, Tatsuya doesn't have much in the way of personality, and you'd be very wrong. There's certainly more ambiguity about Tatsuya, that's left up to the player to decide. But there are also many aspects that are informed by the plot. He has a reputation as a bad boy because of his aloof nature. He's incredibly standoffish towards Lisa and Akichi in the beginning, and even his own brother, Katsuya. Tatsuya also has a shadow, meaning he's just as human and flawed as everyone else in the cast. His vague personality is even used by his shadow to mock him, claiming that he's directionless in life and has no dreams of his own. He wants to be more like Maya and have an ideal to strive towards, but he just can't find it, much to his frustration. Tatsuya is heavily associated with fire. He's a Leo, the sign ruled by the sun. The sun is also his arcana, a very pleasant arcana which relates to happiness and positivity. Traits that are seen in young Tatsuya, but are completely absent from present Tatsuya. Similarly, his Leo sign, which usually describes a person who is adept at leadership, is also incorrect. He's not the party's leader at all. Tatsuya's arcana has been reversed because of the traumatic incident at the shrine. Ever since the fire that day, he's just been going with the flow. He's passive and aimless, and these are all traits of the reversed sun arcana. 
Tatsuya defeats his shadow and accepts his part of himself. But his arcana never regains its upright position. At least, not in this world. Tatsuya's association with the sun also extends to his personas. His initial persona is Vulcanus, the Roman god of fire and forging. His ultimate persona is Apollo, the Greek Olympian god of healing and the arts, and is the most famous of the sun gods. Finally, we have Jun Kurosu, a character I've already briefly touched on. Jun is given false memories by Nyarlathotep, which led him to becoming Joker, a figure that at first seems bent on revenge, but is actually just in pain. I've previously mentioned that Jun doesn't face a shadow like the other characters, and that's technically true. But he does have something very similar. His Joker form itself is his shadow. Joker is a clear reflection of the trickster archetype. A figure that is sometimes a malicious, deceitful con man, and other times an amusing carnival attraction. It's sometimes a supernatural force, and other times a subhuman farce. Jung wrote that it was a reflection of a primitive psyche found in the collective unconscious, and for the most part goes unacknowledged by the conscious ego. He notes how people are quick to blame a mysterious, unseen force for misfortune, such as jinxes and bad luck. But all of these are a simple projection of the trickster onto other things, Similar to how we project our own negative traits onto other people. It's a naive and childlike psyche, yet has the potential for great evil. And it can be found in all people, whether consciously or not, like a shadow. It's the part of ourselves that holds up a mirror and mocks us with glee. The trickster may dupe others, but that doesn't mean they're above being duped themselves. Nyalafotep himself is also a trickster, and he certainly dupes Jun. Nyalafotep's mockery of Jun is an allusion to the mass circle. As kids, they use the group to escape their everyday problems and pretend to be superheroes. Living in a fantasy is the work of the shadow. It's the desire for short-term satisfaction over long-term success. Joker would do the same thing by granting the desires of the shadow, under the guise of granting dreams. At first, it seems like this is Jun mocking them, but it's actually Nyarlathotep mocking them all. His arcana is Wheel of Fortune. This arcana is interesting because it's a representation of the Zodiac and the Grand Cross. Right side up, it represents stability and change in the universe. It's a very optimistic card that suggests things have a way of working themselves out, and that they'll soon get better. Reversed, it means a turn for the worse. Bad luck and misfortune will soon find you. It still represents change in the universe, but not for the better. It means that forces outside of your control are influencing your fate. This fits John perfectly as someone whose fate has been radically altered by Nyarlathotep. Jun's arcana doesn't return to its right side up position until the very end, when the universe is literally altered and things change for the better. The Aquarius sign in the wheel belongs to Jun. It describes a person who is eccentric and aloof, making them hard to understand. But at their core, they're good-hearted with strong humanitarian ideals. 
We can see this in Jun's motives as Joker. All he wanted to do was help humanity and lead them to their dreams. Just as Maya did for all of them when they were younger. Aquarius is also heavily associated with friendship, which is ultimately what brought Jun out of his delusions. Specifically though, it's his close bond to Tatsuya which has the most importance. Jun and Tatsuya are described as looking very similar by Maya. She says they're like doppelgangers, and makes reference to a poem by Heinrich Hein titled Der Doppelganger, which is used in the song of the same name by Franz Schubert. The night is still, the streets are quiet. In this house lived my love. She left the town long before, yet her house still stands in the same place. There I also see a man standing and staring into the heavens, wringing his hands in violent grief. I shudder when I behold his face. The moon reveals to me my own likeness. You doppelganger, you pale companion, why do you mimic my love sickness that tormented me at this place for so many nights in the past? This poem is also featured in the opening movie, similar to the butterfly dream in the first game. So, what is a doppelganger? In folklore, it's often interpreted as an omen of death. They're an antagonistic force that looks exactly like us, but have a contrasting personality. They threaten to show the world a side of ourselves we do not associate with. This gives them the power to destroy our tenuous relationship with society. For this reason, they're a threat to our very existence. If this sounds incredibly similar to the Jungian Shadow, well, that's no coincidence. The Shadow's in Innocent Sin are based on this age-old tale of man meeting his alter ego. In the poem, a man encounters a grieving version of himself. It's a reminder of past pain one that will not go away. It follows the man everywhere. However, he's unable to recognize this man as himself. To him, it's a malicious entity. A trickster, if you will. Wanting to torture him. This is why he accuses it of being a doppelganger. This poem heavily relates to three characters. Maya, Tatsuya, and Jun. Jun is the man dealing with his grief. Maya is the girl who left the town long ago. And Tatsuya, as described by Maya, is Jun's doppelganger. They're both grieving. They share the same pain because of the incident at the shrine. But instead of seeing Tatsuya as a reflection of himself, he sees him as a doppelganger mocking his pain. But why are John and Tatsuya described as doppelgangers by Maya? Once again, it comes back to zodiac signs. Aquarius and Leo are often considered sibling signs. They're directly across from each other on the zodiac. This means that they have a high degree of compatibility. Both are quiet, unapproachable, have a strong desire for friendship, and are destined for leadership roles, like their role model, Maya. Their relationship is heavily implied to be homosexual in nature, with Jun being one of the romance options along with Lisa, Maya and Ikichi. 
the connections go deeper when we start looking at their personas. Jun's initial persona is Hermes. Hermes is a Greek god who also embodies the trickster archetype, a nod to his previous role as Joker. In mythology, Hermes was known to play tricks on his half-brother Apollo, which is Tatsia's ultimate persona. One day, Hermes decided to steal some of Apollo's cattle. When caught for his misdeed, Apollo decided to let the young Hermes off. Not only this, but he let Hermes keep the stolen cattle, in exchange for the lyre instrument that he himself had invented. Jun and Tatsia also exchange items to cement their friendship. Tatsuya gives him his watch, and Jun gives him his lighter. This can also be seen reflected in their personas. Vulcanus looks like a lighter, and Kronos, Jun's ultimate persona, has a clock face. All of the personas are subtly interconnected in this way. The characters' relationships with each other often mirrors their personas in myth. To give some more examples, Jun sees Maya as a mother. The Pleiades Maya is the mother of Hermes. Lisa is obsessed with marrying Tatsia. Venus was the consort of Vulcanus. Tatsia and Maya have the polar opposite Arcanas. Apollo and Artemis were twins, but were associated with polar opposite celestial bodies. The Sun and the Moon. Not all of the connections between the characters come from Greco-Roman mythology, though. As you may recall, Maya is pierced by the spear that penetrated Christ on the cross. Now, this is obviously dripping with symbolism. But to understand what that is, requires further context. The importance lies in this arrangement of the characters in the collective unconscious. We've already established that Tatsuya, Lisa, Akichi and Jun have the four signs of the Grand Cross. Maya is always depicted at the intersecting point of these four signs. Right in the middle. The zodiac is a circle where each sign has an associated animal or symbol. Tatsuya, the Leo, is the lion. Lisa, the Taurus, is the bull. Jun, the Aquarius, is the water bearer. Akichi, the Scorpio, is associated with a few different animals. The most common being the scorpion. But the more relevant one here is the eagle. These four can be seen featured in the Wheel of Fortune Arcana. They're the four fixed signs of the zodiac, representing the balance of the universe and the elements. This arrangement of four elements is also known as a tetramorph, and it's present in a lot of religious symbiology. It can be seen in Ezekiel's vision of God in the Book of Ezekiel. He speaks of God's chariot being drawn by four creatures with four different faces. The face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. These four would later be used to depict the four evangelists of the Gospels. Matthew as the angel, Mark as the lion, Luke as the ox, and John as the eagle. The water bearer of the Aquarius is represented by an angel in this case. This is why John's joker form turns into an angel, in case you are wondering. At the centre of most depictions of the Christian tetramorph is Christ himself, sitting on his heavenly throne. Maya Amano is Christ, 
Antatsia, John, Lisa and Akichi are her four apostles. This is a perfect analogy when you consider that the four derive their ideology from Maya. She taught them to follow their dreams. Through them, Maya's upbeat and positive worldview is continued to be propagated. Just as the teachings of Christ were passed down by the Gospels. Sadly, this must also mean that Maya's tale ends in a similar fashion to Christ. Let's not forget the title of this game, shall we? As we've already analysed, the ending was brought about by the imperfections of humanity. Their tendency to give in to sin and commit the unspeakable. The fact that all of this transpires in the collective unconscious brings even more layers. It implies that these are archetypal stories that are destined to be repeated. This arrangement of the party can also be read as a reference to Jung's Quaternity, the symbol of wholeness and individuation. It can be seen in Jung's four psychic functions, Thinking, sensation, feeling, and intuition. This indicates that they have succeeded in becoming better people. They've realised their individuality. The end goal of individuation. This is why Philemon remarks that if only more people were like them, the ending's tragedy would not have occurred. The game ends with the final battle against Nyalafotep. This will be the last thing we take a look at in this video. Just like the first game, the last boss is extremely symbolic. However, while Pandora was symbolic for Maki, Nyalafotep is symbolic for all of the characters. After his Hitler form is defeated, he turns into the Great Father, a monstrosity made up of five separate bodies. The main body is Nyalafotep, but the limbs represent something else. When we were analysing the characters earlier, you might have noticed a recurring theme. They all have something called a father complex. The relationship with parents is a big part of psychodynamic psychology. Both Jung and Freud sought to discover the role this played in the development of the psyche. They both had their own ideas. Freud coined the Oedipus complex. The theory that a boy is unconsciously competing against his father for the sexual possession of his mother. He's essentially trying to replace him as the patriarch of the household. These theories were built on in Jung's paper, the significance of the father in the destiny of the individual. It examines many examples where the relationship with the father has drastically shaped a person's life. Behind the father stands the archetype of the father. And in this pre-existent archetype lies the secret of the father's power. Just as the power which forces the bird to migrate is not produced by the bird itself, but derives from its ancestors. Jung once again put these issues in the context of archetypes and the collective unconscious. Innocent Sin mainly deals with the father complex, which is why I cite this paper in particular. The father archetype is a powerful authority figure. It is a benevolent guiding hand that shapes how we think, feel and perceive the world. That's a lot of responsibility. And needless to say, an abusive father archetype can bring about disastrous results. 
psychological complexes that can only be resolved after a long-fought battle with the unconscious. This is why Nyarlathotep chose to take the form of a father. He used this fatherly archetype to shape humanity for the worse, and during his final form he uses it as a weapon against the party. He is Neurosis personified. This final boss is dripping with symbolism, as I previously mentioned. But it's not just because of what the boss is. It's also in how you fight it. <laughs> Nyalafotep starts off extremely powerful and deadly. He has a single turn, plus an extra four for each appendage. The main body is Nyalafotep, an ideal father figure for Jun that wanted him to remain his loyal puppet. He, your father's call. The four appendages are also the fathers of the characters. Their appearance can be seen in Kaneko's render of the final form. In the actual game though, you only know this because of the lines they speak before attacking. Some of these lines are key to their neurosis. Call me Papa. <laughs> this is the real Akinari Kashihara, the man who failed to live up to his son's archetypal image of a father. You are Japanese. <laughs> this is Steven Silverman, and his attempts at shaping Lisa into a traditional Japanese woman. I hope you find happiness. This is Masataka Amano, the war correspondent father of Maya Amano. He died following his dreams and was never around for his family. His words still linger in Maya's memory though, and they are the basis for her outlook on life. She follows her dreams and encourages others to do the same. Do as I say. This is Kinkichi Mishina, the strict father that exerts absolute control over Akichi's destiny. He'll tolerate no deviations from his plan of making him his successor. Curiously, Tatsuya's father is missing here. This doesn't mean he doesn't have father issues of his own, though. They're hinted at when you talk to his brother, Katsuya. This would be further expanded upon in Eternal Punishment, but Tatsuya's character is kept more vague here. He is the silent protagonist of this game, after all. The characters have to destroy each of the limbs representing their parents. This makes Nyarlathotep weaker, and by the end, he isn't much of a threat. This could symbolise the characters overcoming their neurosis, becoming stronger people that are no longer bound to their parents. We'll decide our own future! It's the last step on the road to individuality, of fully realising the self and becoming whole. Until, of course, this. Early in the game, Maya quotes Le Calment by Marie Lawrenson. Worse than alone, exiled. Worse than exiled, dead. Worse than dead, forgotten. This would be foreshadowing for the fate of the party. They're not exiled, they're not dead. They are simply forgotten. Everything they experienced in this world is lost. Their friendship, their growth, their dreams. They're all products of a forgotten world. A fate worse than death. Of course, the story doesn't actually end here. But it does for now. 
a tragic, bittersweet tale of not just the faults of humanity, but their strengths too. Insert Disc 2 of the Persona 2 Innocent Sin Analysis. If you're watching in the official playlist, it'll begin shortly. Thank you for watching! <laughs>